Welcome to this Jeremy Bamba and White House Farm podcast, Season 3. My name is Emma Morris, PR Coordinator for the campaign, and here's this month's campaign and legal update. In campaign news, although not all the documents we recently obtained, which we discussed in a recent podcast, are key, those we thought may be helpful to the case and that we haven't seen before were sent to the legal team, and Jeremy is now in possession of all this material. As we mentioned in last month's social media podcast, we had planned to close two of our Twitter accounts. Whilst one is closed and our official account is now Bamba Tweets, the account Free Bamba Now has been handed over to an independent campaigner, so please watch out for tweets on both of these accounts. If you're not already a member of our Facebook group, I'd encourage you to join, where you'll have access to our monthly Facebook Zoom meetings where you can get all the latest updates on Jeremy's case at this very important time. This month, Jeremy and the legal team have continued working with the CCRC and they're giving us monthly updates on their work, so we're hoping for good news soon. In this podcast, we will be discussing the issue of non-disclosure in Jeremy's case, an issue which has hampered and continues to hamper his ability to prove his innocence for more than 37 years. We will look at what disclosure is, the attempts made by Jeremy and his legal team to obtain disclosure, what documents we have most recently sought disclosure of, and the response received from Essex Police. So, what is disclosure? According to the Crown Prosecution Service, put simply, when someone is charged with an offence, disclosure made by the prosecution supplies the defence with a copy of, or access to, all material that is capable of undermining the prosecution's case and or assisting the defence. But does this always happen? Here's an example which was widely reported in the media at the time which helps us set out how dangerous non-disclosure is to justice and how innocent victims of the Crown's non-disclosure can be wrongfully incarcerated. In 2015, Liam Allen, a student from South East London, was charged with 12 counts of rape and sexual assault. He admitted to having had sex with the alleged victim, but maintains the encounters were consensual. He spent two and a half years on bail with these charges hanging over him. When the case came to trial, the prosecution barrister insisted that the police disclose around 40,000 text and WhatsApp messages from the accuser's phone. The defence had repeatedly asked for disclosure of these messages, but the police had, up until that point, refused to comply on the basis that there was nothing to disclose. The messages, when finally disclosed at the Crown's insistence, revealed that Liam's accuser had told friends that she had enjoyed casual sex with Alan and that she fantasised about being raped. As a result of these disclosures, Liam Allen's trial collapsed. Had the messages not been disclosed, he could have spent many years in prison for a crime he clearly did not commit. There has been significant and continued non-disclosure in Jeremy's case, potentially running into, at best, hundreds and at worst, thousands of relevant and important case documents. In addition to this, the Criminal Cases Review Commission, the CCRC, wrote to the defence in March 2000, stating that exhibits had been illegally destroyed by Special Branch in 1996. This was despite a court order having been in place since 1994 to retain, preserve and disclose all material to the defence. These exhibits included Sheila Caffell's nightdress, June Bamber's nightdress, pillowcases from the main bedroom, the Bible that was photographed leaning against the top of Sheila's arm, Neville Bamber's pyjamas, and Daniel and Nicholas Cavell's pyjamas. In a statement to the Metropolitan Police in 2002, the officer who ordered the destruction claimed he was unaware of the ruling to disclose and preserve this material. Of course, 
you would expect that action would have been taken against this officer for this careless or deliberate destruction of pertinent case exhibits yet his excuse was simply accepted and no action was ever taken against him this illegal destruction has prevented the defence being able to conduct forensic examinations of these items which could have produced results to assist jeremy in his continued fight for justice a fact which is quite simply unforgivable a further example of blatant non-disclosure occurred in 2020 when jeremy's legal team took the crown prosecution service to a judicial review for its refusal to disclose 27 specific and referenced documents these documents known to exist as they are set out in previously disclosed papers would have answered a very material aspect of the case namely prima facie conclusions reached by an eminent ballistic expert that there may have been two silencers examined in the investigation the high court refused disclosure of any of the 27 documents and the judicial review was lost however justice julian knowles presiding said in his summing up that i have carefully considered the arguments of the parties and have read and considered all of the material that has been lodged i have carefully considered the decision of saney j and for the reasons that he gave with which i agree and for the following reasons i have concluded that permission should be refused this does not leave the claimant without remedy much work has already been done and he has the makings of a fresh submission to the ccrc including an unqualified report from mr boyce in support of his case that there was a second moderator recovered from the farm that provides him with the necessary basis for arguing that his convictions are unsafe if ever there was a case where the ccrc should be approached to make a decision on what is said to be new evidence it is this one this is a massively complex case which has been investigated and reinvestigated by more than one police force over some 35 years the body of material is vast after so many years and so much litigation the ccrc is the body undoubtedly best placed to consider the claimant's arguments this case is so complicated and has so many overlapping layers that judicial review is a hopelessly blunt tool with which to address and determine the claimant's arguments even deciding what disclosure has or has not been made is fraught with difficulty even if the claimant were right on his primary case the court is hardly in a position to say whether the cps's determination that it would not mean the convictions are unsafe is one which is not reasonably open to it it simply does not have the material or understanding of all the details of the case to be able to make that determination whilst disappointing this ruling essentially gave an endorsement to approach the CCRC, who has the power to order disclosure. It was also during the judicial review process that the CPS inadvertently revealed to the defence information regarding the forensic examinations of silencers by a scientist at Huntingdon Laboratory in 1985, which had never previously been known to them requests were immediately made for the relevant general examination records pertinent to these hidden examinations and the results achieved by the scientists however even though they had accidentally revealed partial evidence the cps refused to expand on this and would not disclose the examination records or statements of this scientist additionally during the course of the judicial review it came to light that DSI Ainsley and D.I. Ron Cook had provided material to the media, namely the author Carol Ann Lee, which had been taken home by two officers, retained and then handed out. Photographic evidence obtained from Ms. Lee's Instagram account of this material caused the defence to realise that some of this documentation had never been disclosed to them, yet the CPS and Essex Police still failed to release it. In addition, 
DSI Ainsley admitted that he had taken case material home and then destroyed it, as was reported in the media. These issues formed the basis of an official complaint regarding a series of actions of Ainsley and Cook in the case, and this was lodged with Essex Police, the Police Standards Department, and then the IOPC, as well as the CCRC. We recently had a decision from the IOPC, which was reported in the media and will be discussed in detail in a future podcast. We also discovered in 2020 that there are 226 files held on Jeremy and the deaths of his family at the National Archives at Kew. All of these files are closed and initially had opening dates of 2054, but at the end of 2022, seemingly following several Freedom of Information requests, the closure of some of these files were inexplicably extended to 2070. Jeremy will be 109 years old, and it is doubtful that anyone involved in the case will be alive at that point. Records held by the National Archives are usually closed because they contain exceptionally sensitive records and information, the disclosure of which would not be in the public interest in that it would harm the defence, international relations, national security or economic interests of the UK. What could possibly be in these files that would warrant them being closed in line with this and for such an extended period of time? Why did they extend the period further in late 2022 from 2054 to 2070? On whose authority were these dates increased? These are all questions we are still seeking answers to. Whilst it's fact that non-disclosure in this case runs into untold numbers, but certainly hundreds of thousands of documents, this podcast will focus on just 20 very specific and key documents that Jeremy and his defence requested disclosure of in a letter to Essex Police from human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell in 2021. Essex Police Chief Constable BJ Harrington absolutely refused to comply with any of these disclosure requests. His refusal contravenes three court orders compelling Essex Police to disclose all material in this case, which we will now set out. The first, a judicial review issued by the Central Criminal Court in 1994. An order to disclose material came after Jeremy Bamba sought disclosure of DNA evidence from Essex Police and they refused. Despite the judgment instructing the Home Secretary to disclose material to Jeremy Bamba, all DNA material continued to be withheld and then, apart from the cell moderator, was destroyed two years later. As mentioned earlier, a special branch officer instructed the incineration of evidence in 1996. Secondly, an order by the Court of Appeal Criminal Division, Royal Courts of Justice, dated the 30th of July 2001. This order was issued before Jeremy Bamber's 2002 appeal. This general order was to disclose all material, including pre trial evidence, all details of the destruction of DNA material by Special Branch, laboratory submissions, all relevant material to the findings of the Police Complaints Authority inquiry details of material the Crown intends to withhold, all material from the Essex and City of London Police inquiries, and all material previously made available to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. There was only partial disclosure of this material. Thirdly, an order served by the Court of Appeal Criminal Division, Royal Courts of Justice, dated the 2nd of July 2002. This order was a specific request for material, including audio tapes, diaries, witness statements, bases of information contained within a police report, documents held at the mortuary in Chelmsford and Essex Hospital, a statement regarding regulations governing destruction of exhibits and a statement of the officer authorising destruction in 1996, all statements and results in respect of DNA testing of the sound moderator, Disclosure of police interviews with the Stoke and Church Inquiry, 
guidelines regarding completion of exhibit books and forms, disclosure of fresh evidence and unused material. The order was only partially complied with. So, what documents did Peter Tatchell request from Essex Police and why are they important to the case? 1. Original manuscripts, handwritten logs by Malcolm Bonnet, civilian telephone operator at Police HQ, and PC West from 3.26am, Neville Bamber's call, saying, Daughter gone berserk and has got hold of one of my guns. And 3.36am, Jeremy Bamber's call, on the 7th of August 1985, stating his father had called him to say his sister had gone crazy and had hold of the gun. Malcolm Bonnet's original handwritten statement stated the 13th of September, 8th of November and 16th of December 1985, referring to Mr Bamba and Mr Bamba Jr. The evidence will prove that PC West received two calls on the 7th of August 1985, one from Neville Bamba at 3.26am and one from Jeremy Bamba at 3.36am proving that the perpetrator was Sheila Caffell, not Jeremy. 2. Audio recordings of PC West's call to HQ operator Malcolm Bonnet, all radio traffic referred to by Malcolm Bonnet. Again, these will provide clarity about what calls were received in and from whom. The Ray Team's open microphones, these will provide a running commentary of what the Ray Team saw when entering and searching the property, and will confirm, amongst other things, if Sheila was first seen in the kitchen and where Neville Bamba was first found. 3. Original situation report made by P.S. Buse following the sighting of someone alive in White House Farm that was seen through a bedroom window, prompting him to request firearms assistance. 4. Original statements made on the 7th of August by P.S. Buse and P.C. Mile, who saw the movement in the bedroom window of White House Farm. Buse has provided different versions in TV documentaries over the years of who saw what in the window. In one interview, he said it was Jeremy who pointed out movement in the bedroom window. In another, he said it was P.C. Mile. And finally, in another, he said it was he himself who spotted the movement. In all three, he denied it was a person and instead stated he quickly realised it was moonlight or a trick of the light. This situation report will provide clarity on exactly what was seen, what caused Bues, Maya and Jeremy to abandon the recce after only five minutes and run back to PC Saxby, call for firearms assistance and at that point open an incident report. We believe this was done because all three had seen Sheila alive and active in the bedroom window. Had it simply been a trick of the light, as Buse stated, he quickly realised it was, there would have been no reason for the three men to have ceased the recce at that point, and they would have simply carried on and completed it. 5. D.I. Keneally's 6th of September report showing his investigation stating the evidence indicated that Sheila was responsible. 6. D.I. Keneally's statement made post-trial for the 1986 Dickinson inquiry. Following complaints from the extended family that D.I. Taft-Jones was, in their eyes, not investigating their allegations about Jeremy properly, D.I. Keneally was asked to take a fresh look at the case. He concluded that... As D.I. Jones has said all along, Sheila was responsible. However, his report and any statements written by Keneally have never been released to the defence. 7. P.C. Milbank's pocketbook recording of all his monitorings of the telephone line at White House Farm from 6.09am onwards on the 7th of August. 8. The audio recording of the 999 call made from inside White House Farm at 6.09am on the 7th of August. During the Stoke and Church investigation, in preparation for the 2002 appeal, police discovered a log that stated a 999 call was made from inside White House Farm at 6.09am. 
Essex police tried to explain this away by saying they had connected the open phone line at White House Farm to the emergency line to listen to goings-on from inside the house. However, the police were already monitoring the phone line through the police headquarters line from 5.50am, where it was being constantly monitored from this point, so there was no need to change it. Furthermore, in a statement from Jean Rowe, the telephone operator, she clearly stated that she was not permitted to tie up the emergency 999 line, so monitoring was done through police headquarters. The Stoke and Church action also specifically states it was a call made from White House Farm and in no way indicates that the police were merely listening in to an open phone line. The release of the audio of this call would clarify that someone was alive and active inside White House Farm at that time, whilst Jeremy was outside with the police. 9. The original handwritten statements and pocketbook entries from the first case investigation of murder-suicide, referenced SC forward slash 688 forward slash 85, including statements from 15 key officers that will provide a true picture of what happened when the police arrived at the scene shortly before 4am to when they left later that day. Amongst other things, these will help establish where Neville Bamba and Sheila Caffell were first seen and evidence that the bodies of the deceased, the rifle and the Bible were all moved, as were chairs in the kitchen prior to the crime scene photos being taken. 10. The complete set of blood charts relative to the silencers and Sheila Caffell's nightdress. This will provide details of whether or not Sheila's nightdress was contaminated with any of the other victims' blood, which would indicate that she was responsible for the shootings. In addition, these undisclosed blood charts may assist the defence in establishing exactly whose blood groups were present in which silencer. The evidence we have to date reveals that blood and enzyme groups, which were the same as at least two of the wider family's blood, were discovered. One of these was the results matching not only Sheila Caffell, but which also matched exactly the blood group and related enzyme components of Robert Bowflower. What else are Essex police trying to hide regarding the blood results? 11. All photographs taken of all the rooms in White House Farm, including those containing firearms and all telephones in situ. In court, the prosecution asserted that Neville Bamber was meticulous about gun safety and would not have left a rifle lying around for Sheila to easily grab. However, this contradicts Anne Eaton's own diary notes, which states there were guns lying all around the property, including on the stairs and in the toilet. The prosecution also asserted that Jeremy had hidden the telephone from the master bedroom at some point prior to the 7th of August in a pile of magazines, so Neville and June would be unable to call for help during the incident. However, in Detective Superintendent Michael Ainsley's statement, he said the phone in question was on a shelf in the office with the cord wrapped around the set on the morning of the 7th of August. Therefore, it couldn't possibly have been hidden by Jeremy in the way the prosecution described. Photos of the study would show if the phone was, indeed, in that room, disproving this element of the prosecution's assertions. 12. All photographs of the silencer and the sound moderator. 13. The exhibit labels for the silencer for rifle SBJ forward slash 1. 14. The general examination records. Holmes box 12 slash 34 for the paint sample RM slash 1. 15. The diagrams created by Andrew Palmer on the 11th of September of the cell moderator DB slash 1. 16. The general examination records of Louise Float dated 12th of September. 17. The pocket notebook of DS Robert Cook. 18. All forensic scientists' pre-trial handwritten statements, lab reports, 
and post-trial DCI Dickinson inquiry interviews pertaining to the sound moderators. Essex Police insists that only one sound moderator was found at White House Farm and it was found by David Bowflower on the 10th of August. However, in a press conference, Assistant Chief Constable Peter Simpson stated, A silencer was found at the farmhouse on the day of the killings, but this does not have to mean anything that is suspicious. Within the police forensic files, we have discovered that two silencers were indeed examined. One found on the 7th of August by Detective Sergeant Stanley Bryan Jones, referenced SBJ-1, and one by David Bowflower on the 10th of August, referenced DB-1. The police then conflated the reference numbers to a brand new one, DRB-1, which gave the appearance that only one sound moderator was found and examined. By conflating the reference numbers, it means that they also conflated the contaminants found on both sound moderators. This then made it look like just one was used in the incident to fight with Neville Bamba in the kitchen where it supposedly hit against the underside of the arga, scraping paint from it, and blood deposits where it was said to have been used to shoot Sheila Caffell. Disclosure of these documents will prove conclusively that the sound moderator evidence was entirely fabricated and that no sound moderator was used during the incident. 19. Public interest immunity file on Julie Mugford, Jeremy Bamber's girlfriend at the time of the killings, referring to a deal with the Crown Prosecution Service in exchange for immunity from prosecution for five criminal offences, three of which were unknown to the jury plus disclosure of the Essex Police file on the £25,000 News of the World deal agreed to in November or December 1985, pre-trial by Julie Mugford via her solicitor. We suspect that in exchange for Julie Mugford's testimony, she was given immunity from prosecution. There are many documents already in our possession which suggest this. The deal with the News of the World was conditional on a guilty verdict and was not disclosed to the jury and so they were unaware that she also had a financial incentive to lie in court. 20. Sheila Caffell's medical and psychiatric records referring to her conversations with her psychiatrist where she informs him that she was afraid she would kill her children. Plus, Sheila's diaries during periods where she had psychotic episodes in 1983-1985. In refusing to disclose this very specific and limited key material, BJ Harrington said that Essex Police had complied with their obligations of disclosure. But this is not correct. After the 8th of September 1985, a new case number was assigned when the investigation changed from murder-suicide to five murders. Whilst the file on the five murders has been disclosed, the original murder-suicide file, dated between the 7th of August and the 7th of September, when the investigation was one of murder-suicide, which we believe will contain the documentation requested, has not. B.J. Harrington went on to attempt to justify his stance by stating that the subsequent appeal and litigation in Jeremy's case had been denied and that We have accepted that we made mistakes in relation to the initial handling of the scene and investigation in 1985. However, the evidence and investigative process has withstood intense judicial and public scrutiny on many occasions, both in the court and with independent reviews. He ended by saying, At this time, I will not be authorising my officers to disclose any further material to Mr Bamber's solicitor. His Freudian slip regarding further disclosure of material just goes to support what the defence has always argued that, despite court orders compelling Essex Police to disclose all the material in this case, Evidence has been and continues to be deliberately withheld from the defence. 
it is remarkable that such a senior officer as harrington is prepared to ignore court orders for the reasons outlined in his letter how could any review investigation or appeal possibly be conducted and judged fairly when such significant non-disclosure of key documents exist if the documents conclude what we believe they do and that the evidence already in our possession suggests they will then the fact is jeremy bamba would never have been convicted of the white house farm tragedies in fact the case would never have come to court and jeremy bamba would not have spent the last thirty-seven and a half years of his life in prison for a crime he did not commit thanks for listening to this podcast if you'd like to do something to help jeremy bamba then sign our online petition to the Home Secretary for the disclosure of case documents still withheld by Essex Police. Visit www.change.org and search for Jeremy Bamber. And don't forget to share the link with your friends and family.